Hello, this is Nathan Wood, pastor of North Dayton Baptist Church, and welcome to day 159 of the McShane Reading Plan. So glad you could join us. We're in Deuteronomy 12, Psalms 97 and 98, Isaiah 40, and Revelation 10. I really don't know where to begin here today. This is a heavy, heavy hitter. Um, and so many individual truths <laughs> that tie together so beautifully. Um, scripture is a beautiful tapestry, beautiful, beautiful tapestry. And even within, I'm stricken by how these groups of four or five or six chapters tie with each other thematically. It's like a theme of a song being woven in between different, um, in between different scenes, like, uh, if you ever listen to film score, different characters uh, in really good movies, <laughs> I guess, in some really good movies, um, characters will have themes. And when two characters are together, their themes will intertwine. Or if there's a third, then their theme would be woven into that group of themes. And then maybe there's an underlying theme of where they are. And each location has a different theme. So there's a theme and a theme and a theme all being woven together. So it's a picture for your ears. Like thematic colors or characters appearing in different scenes in a picture or different, a series of pictures. Um, it's just, it's so beautiful. Um, so we're going to dive in. I've already wasted two minutes <laughs> contemplating that, but really enjoy the feast of these chapters today. Please, please do. Deuteronomy 12 reminds the children of Israel that they are to dispose utterly of all false worship and anything, any high place to God, false gods, let it be just utterly destroyed. He reminds them that they will not worship the Lord the same way that the heathen or the Gentiles have worshipped false gods. And by false gods, it's not just talking about statues. It's talking about the evil spirits that were honored by those statues, which were fallen angels, ladies and gentlemen receiving worship and they were receiving false worship they were receiving unholy worship certainly setting themselves up as gods certainly that's satan's mo to set himself up as deity fallen angels to set themselves up as deities it's important that we remember that mythology is not necessarily just some imagination of men they worshipped evil spirits posing as good. And these evil spirits so twisted their mind that they caused these people to put their children through the fire. It's important that we remember that proper worship is the way that God wants us to worship. However he says for us to worship is the way we worship, not the way somebody else worships. You see, when we try to compare things, compare ourselves to other religions and try to find the binding ties and, oh, there's, there's just uh, superficial differences. No, there are huge differences, ladies and gentlemen. Huge differences. God is the truth. Jesus Christ. Um, even Jesus, when he's here, acknowledges that the offering had to be made in Jerusalem according to the law. Couldn't be made anywhere that he pleased. So he was sacrificed where? In Jerusalem, on the Passover, so that the scriptures may be fulfilled. It wasn't just arbitrary. He couldn't just go up and die a painless death in some remote location. He had to die a painful death bloody death innocently in Jerusalem 
to be the Passover lamb, the ultimate sacrifice. God is telling them, hey, listen, this is, it's not about the burnt offerings. It's not about, it's not even about the law per se. The law is there to tell you that you're sinning. Deuteronomy 12 is a huge bit that reminds us that the law was fulfilled by Jesus. We're to love the law. Yes. But how do we love the law? Do we love the law by trying to keep it? We can't keep this. If you wanted to keep the law, you'd have to sacrifice, ladies and gentlemen. And that sacrifice can't take place without a physical temple. Christ made sure that we couldn't sacrifice because guess what? He is the ultimate sacrifice. Also, a couple times in Deuteronomy 12, it talks about how kosher is not really that big a deal. It's about the blood. The blood is what is the at the core of the imagery here because the blood of Jesus Christ, not the blood of animals, was, God didn't want them to eat the blood of animals because he wanted to understand that blood is life. But the ultimate life blood would be the blood of Jesus Christ, the perfect, sinless, heaven's blood of the Son of Man. David's blood. Adam's blood. God's blood. All in one. The blood of Abraham. The blood of Isaac and Jacob. Shed. For you and me. It's not about sacrifices. He fulfilled the law. He died where he had to be killed. He made the sacrifice. It's not about what you eat. It's about how you worship him in spirit and in truth. Remember the woman at the well. True worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. There is no sacrificial system without the temple in Jerusalem. The temple is now here, ladies and gentlemen. When we trust in Jesus Christ, we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. You can't go arguing. I'm sorry, friend, you cannot go arguing in favor of keeping the law of Moses for righteousness sake. It is folly. Only Jesus Christ, Christ alone. Yes, we are to love the Jewish people. Yes, we are to not curse them. Yes, we are to pray for them and reach out to them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yes, he will restore the kingdom unto David as he has promised. But let us not be tripped up with man's traditions and rules and regulations. Look at verse 1 of Psalm 97. The Lord reigneth, let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the isles be glad thereof. How could the isles be glad if we were being put under the bondage of the law? We're being set free from the bondage of dogmas of demons, ladies and gentlemen. God has not rescued us from one bondage to a new bondage. He has rescued us to worship in spirit and in truth. Verse 5, the hills mounted like wax in the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. Folks, all creation is just, it cannot stand his presence. You think we appease him through deeds? spirit and in truth our deeds will follow you see when we put ourselves a list of do's and don'ts we think that we can have a checklist i know that i personally you know when when you're when you're a kid and your mom or your dad or when you're married and your wife or your your wife or your husband gives usually it's wife's two husbands but maybe that's stereotypical but if somebody a boss gives you a list of tasks and you can go If you think that you if you think that you've done or fulfilled all these tasks now that's just about it that's not how we're ever supposed to be before God our task is never done until he calls us home and then we have new obligations and duties to do joyfully forevermore ladies and gentlemen he cannot be satisfied by ticking off matters of the list. He wants nothing but our all. Um, yes, one day at seven is a good thing to do, but he wants our every day, our every moment. 
He wants us to worship in spirit and truth. When does the truth exist? All the time. When does our spirit exist? Eternally. All the time. We don't have just a Sabbath or a Sunday worship, or we shouldn't. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand, his holy arm, hath gotten victory. Holy arm, the right hand, Jesus Christ. Sing a new song, a new covenant. There's a new thing coming on. It's come. He's come. It is yet to come. The Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen, in the sight of the Gentiles. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. So this is not, again, this is not shoving Gentile culture down the throat of the Jews. And neither is it shoving Jewish law to the imposition of the lives of Gentile believers. What is it doing? It's saying, all of us worship in spirit and in truth, Jesus Christ, his salvation. He's gotten the victory. Does it matter what we do? Oh, yes. We need to obey the commands of the Lord that he has set forth from his lips in his great commission, spoken through his apostles and his prophets. The scripture clearly describes if there's anything that is carried out and into the New Testament and in the church expectation of Christian living. And then there's some things that are just flat out impossible. Again, the sacrificial system can't be carried out. There's been the perfect sacrifice already. Dietary laws no longer valid. Told to Peter, rise Peter, kill and eat. Also, Deuteronomy 12, it's not about kosher anyway. It's about the blood, ultimately the blood of Jesus Christ. Paul told us it's not about holy days. It's about Jesus Christ, God being slain. Folks, any of our any of our religion are trying to say, well, how should we be like this or how should we be like that? All of that is tiddlywinks, playing in the mud compared to we've been washed in the blood of God himself. Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you know him today? Or are you still playing religion? Maybe you're a believer today and you're still dabbling in religion. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not about religion. It's not about a list of do's and don'ts. Yes, there are don'ts. Yes, there are do's. But if you're getting hung up in all this, then you're missing the first thing, and that's how do we follow Christ? What would he have us to do? It seems cliche, but you remember those bracelets in the 90s, all the... All the kid, cool kids were wearing said, WWJD, what would Jesus do? I think a lot of people just imagined what Jesus would do. We know what Jesus would do. It's in here. It's in here. And it should be in here. And it should be in here. Are we hiding his word in our heart and in our mind so that we might not sin against God? We don't find out what sin is based on our feelings. We don't find out what sin is simply because of arbitrary checklists. There is a why to it. There is a knowing God. There is knowing that if I put my lusts ahead of God, it doesn't matter if it's listed in here or not. It's going to be sin. If I know that if I'm supposed to do something good, as Romans tells me, as Paul tells me in Romans, I think it's Romans. To check this. Can I not tell? Let's do it right now. I'm going to look it up because I don't want to get it wrong.
not Romans. It's it's James. Yeah, James four seven. Excuse me, four seventeen. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him is it sin. I apologize. I kept on going back to Paul and Romans, but yeah. If you know to do something good and you don't do it, that's sin. It doesn't matter if it's explicitly written here. Folks, we worship in spirit and in truth. We worship in spirit and in truth. Is your spirit communing with the Holy Spirit of God, with Jesus Christ? Sing unto the Lord with harp, and the harp, and the voice of the psalm, with the trumpets, and the sound of the cornet. Make a joyful noise before the Lord the King. There you go. There's one more, uh, one more item in our list of scriptures that prove that you can worship the Lord with instruments in the sanctuary. In fact, it's not only um, encouraged; it's pretty. <laughs> it's required. It's, a, it's an imperative. Um, I like acapella worship too, but again, prohibiting the use of instrumental music, getting mad about a style of worship when it brings honor and glory to the Lord, that's petty. That's worldly. That's sinful, ladies and gentlemen. Pretending that you're holier than thou because you think that your worship is... Uh, higher than somebody else's. Now, there is such a thing as proper and improper worship, scripturally speaking. We're not to worship the same way that pagans do, and we're certainly not supposed to offer babies up, and guess what? Offering babies, killing the innocent, is pagan. Can't worship God like that. And anybody says that you can worship God and slay the innocent is trying to worship the Lord with the with the uh, deeds that please Satan. You can't do it. It's wickedness. It's wickedness. Um, so yeah, we have to rightly divide the word of truth. We can't just um, look at it as do do's and don'ts. Um, Isaiah 40 is huge. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the day, make straight in the desert the highway for our God. Every hill shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The prophecy of John the Baptist. It's also a prophecy of Elijah who is to come, because Jesus is coming again to fulfill the rest of, of his messianic prophecies. Had the Jewish people, the Jewish religious establishment, accepted his messiahship in the first century when he came the first time? It would have been like he said with John the Baptist. He would have said, this could be Elijah. This is Elijah, if you would believe. It could have all been fulfilled then. But guess what? God orchestrated things and allowed the hearts of wicked men to be turned into their own wicked lusts so that you and me, Mr. Miss Gentile, could be included in this kingdom of Messiah. Praise God. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, verse 8, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Who is the word of God? Jesus Christ. He is above creation. I can't read any of this without thinking uh, in the, the music of Handel's Messiah. You've heard me say that before. O oh, thou that tellest good tidings to Zion, say unto the cities of Judah, Behold. Um, and he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. <laughs> that sounded bad. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> The Lord God comes with a strong hand, a strong arm, rule for him. His reward is with him and his work is for him. Jesus, Jesus, feed his flock like good shepherd. Jesus, gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Oh my gosh, people. 
George Frederick Handel saw it. This is Jesus. He's the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the world. And he's the same one, just like in John 1. He's the creator who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with a span. He has measured heaven and comprehended the dust of the earth and the measure and weighed the mountains and scales and hills and the balance. I'm sorry, I'm shutting tears because I, this is so, this is our Savior. And we get hung up. We get hung up on religion. Yes, there is such a thing as sin. Yes, there are abominations. Yes, we can spit in God's face with what we what we do that we say, well, I'm not sinning because this is not. Yes, there are real sins. But if we get hung up on stupidity and nitpicking, on things that are not sinful, folks, we're just playing religion. If we go shooting the brethren over minor differences, yes, I have theological views that I believe are true. I spoke with a brother last night, um, and we have very differing views when it comes to certain matters. But we affirm the triune God. We affirm salvation by faith in Christ, and that the Holy Spirit comes to the heart of the believer upon salvation. We affirm these things. We affirm that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Folks, if we can affirm these things, we can have a roundtable discussion about the finer points, but you think the devil's not laughing at us while Calvinists are trying to take over uh, traditionalists or Armenian churches and Armenians are trying to call Calvinists uh, heretics while we're shooting at one another. Yes, we have good points and bad points. Yes, there is such a thing as right and wrong. And yes, theology matters. Yes, interpretation of scripture matters. Yes, freedom matters. Yes, God's sovereignty matters. And I'll take points, even in these videos, I'll take points and tell you what I believe. But ladies and gentlemen, we need to serve the living God united united yes there are things that can't be compromised things that are sacred things that mark the marriage of christ and his church of the bridegroom and the bride things that mark um, the sacredness of the family showing the father-son relationship of God to us. There are things that should not be desecrated. There is the sanctity of human life, certainly. And we need to stand together on important, crucial issues, and above all, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, bodily resurrection, and his promised return. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, being his counselor, hath taught him? Who, with whom took he counselor, instructed him, and taught him the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? Folks, I can try to, I talked with another dear pastor um, of mine some time ago, um, not currently, it's been a pastor of the t church I attended, and I can't remember exactly how he said it, but I think all of our theology is silly in the eyes of the living God. And that was the sentiment that, that, he, that he put forward. We can try to codify God, but ultimately, who's directed him? Are we going to take out a book when God works and say, uh, you, can't do, you can't do that? We look like a bunch of nerds with pencils. The living God can do what he wants. And he will behave himself 
accordingly, mark my words. He's perfect in his justice and perfect in his mercy, perfect in his grace. But the Lord will do what he will do. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. Not calling the Lord to come and join our kingdom. Who is on the Lord's side? Behold, the nations are as a drop in the bucket. That's where that comes from, drop in the bucket. Their count is very small dust in the balance. Behold, he taken us up the aisles as a very little thing. The salvation of the world, as hard as it was, that the Son of God would even pray, let this cup pass from me in his agony in the garden. This is going to be a long video, by the way. There's so much in it. <laughs> We're barely scratching the surface. But even at that, it's a light thing for God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? We're not equal to him. There's none equal to him. You cannot compare him to anything. And if we try to compare Christianity to other religions, and we... I mean, sometimes you have to, like, in a polemic or an apologetic sense, but, folks, if we try to mix and match and mingle and say, well, Christianity is just compatible with this over here, you know, this Eastern mysticism. No. Ladies and gentlemen, the Christ that created the world loves those people who have been taken in with lies. And he's calling them to his truth. All of us sinners want to look and say, well, I, I can't do, I can't reject the sin in my life because I was born this way. So God must just love me the way I am. Yes, he does. And he's calling you to be born again. Yes, we were all born this way. Be born again. That's the call of scripture. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? Just like the song that I sang in church camp. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the head and ends of the earth. Feigneth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, to them that have no might. He increases strength. And folks, it's not about the strength of our youth. The strength of our youth is nothing compared to the strength of the Lord because they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I have some blessed, beloved, um, elderly brothers and sisters in my congregation who really lean hard on this. And undoubtedly, there are many broken people of all ages who rely heavily on this. And even youth, youth, rely on this, not on your youth. Remember, Paul told Timothy not to let anybody despise his youth. Youth, we are supposed to respect the, the, um, the elders above us. We are supposed to be respectful. But ladies and gentlemen, our ultimate respect is to the Lord and to them who wait upon the Lord. And then we are to wait upon the Lord ourselves. In Revelation 10, just a couple of thoughts. Verse 6. And he swore by him that liveth forever, who created the heaven and the things that are in the earth and the things that are there and are in the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Time is a creation. If God were bound by time, he could not declare time to come to an end. Think about it. God is not bound by time. He is outside of it. He is eternally in his own mind. Outside of that dimension. Praise God. Time to him is just like a the way we see two-dimensional and one-dimensional things, lines and sheets of paper. Time to him is like a space in time, or a, an object of occupying a space in time. 
he can manipulate it as he sees fit. He can cause the sun to stand still in the sky. He can bend and break the rules as he wants. Verse 9 also. And I went unto the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it, eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth as sweet as honey. <laughs> this is just like I, excuse me, Ezekiel. Eating the book, and it's sweet. When we read the word and we understand it or we understand something about it, we we get knowledge and we it's so sweet to us, but then it's bitter. Why? Because when you know something, you've got to tell people about it. You can't keep it to yourself or you'll just absolutely build up pressure. It'll be like the Dead Sea full of salt and no life because you don't let it out. We have to do so with love and life and kindness, but it's bitter. It's bitter to tell people that this world is evil. When you see so much good and when they seem to be so comfortable in their sin and, and you don't want to bother them, you don't want to you don't want to upset the apple cart. You don't want to be imposing. You don't want to be. Uh, uh, you don't want to be the bearer of bad news. But folks, if we really love people, we'll do like the Glenn Campbell song says: <laughs> just stop and say, "Hey, you're going the wrong way." If somebody's walking the wrong way, you have to stop and say, "Hey, no, no, it's over here." It's actually wrong of us not to point out our neighbor's need for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's hateful for us to do so. And may God forgive me for being a coward in the past or any time in the future, I guess, that I might be inclined to... Uh, I'll just leave them alone. Folks, if we leave people alone, and I'm not talking about hounding people of being evil or mean, or in your face or, or obnoxious. But folks, I, if we leave people alone, where are they gonna go? How are they gonna hear without a preacher? And a preacher is not, a, is not an occupation with a salary, preachers what we're all called to be, proclaimers of the word, making disciples. I've gone 33 minutes. This has got to be one of the longest videos there is. And if you had time to watch it, I thank you. I, um, for those of you who look for 10 and 5 minute videos, I'm sorry. Hopefully you can watch it in segments. But I hope that you love the word more than I do. And I hope that you love the word in your heart and in your mind. I hope you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And if you don't, trust in the Savior, Jesus Christ, please, before it's eternally too late. We love you. Have a good day.